Amen. <clears throat> Our lesson today is coming from uh, the first chapter of James, James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And we're talking about bona fide faith, bona fide faith. Uh, <clears throat> James chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. Uh, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the, dis in the dispersion, greeting, dispersion, greetings, count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, the King James says, endurance, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Uh, bona fide faith. I first heard uh, the word bona fide as a child when I would hear the old folk use it to reference to the authenticity of something. You know, when they would say bona fide, they means true. And uh, my grandmother would say true bone. And so when the book of James, when we look at the book of James, it was written to provide the readers a picture of what authentic faith should lead to. Authentic faith, brothers and sisters, should lead to action. And James says, you have faith because of your works. He said, but I work because of my faith. And so if you have genuine faith, faith ought to lead you into what? It ought to lead you into action. And that's what James is saying in this book. He's saying that bona fide faith is not just a profession, but it's a result to what? Action. It leads to action. It's not just a profession, but it leads to action. You know, we often talk about that you could be a member of the church, which is the fellowship. You can, you can come into this building week after week, and you can profess Christ, but still not know Christ. You, you could talk about how you believe in him, but never believe him. That's a difference. It's a difference in saying that you have faith in God, uh, versus I what? Trust God. Because that's what faith is. It's, it's trust. It's relying upon. And so James teaches us that bona fide faith leads to action. You say whatever you want to say with your mouth, but listen, it's what you do that really reflect the fact that you what? You believe. You know, it's a, it, a story of a little boy, a story of a little boy who got caught in a fire, uh, in an apartment fire. He was on the 11th floor, and his dad was down at the bottom, and the a fire was raging, and the dad from the bottom hollered up to his son and says, jump, to which the son says, but dad, I can't see you. And the daddy shouted back to the son and says, but I can see you. Jump, knowing that I can see you. You may not be able to see me, but I can see you. Faith says we may not be able to see him, but he can see us. I can obey him even when I can't see him. Even when I don't understand what he's doing, I can, what, obey him because when I can't see him, he can always see me. Are y'all listening? That's bona fide faith. That even though, Sister Ray, I cannot see him because sometimes life becomes complicated. Sometimes life presents us with uh, obstacles, trials, and tribulations to where we cannot see him. But we can rest assured knowing 
that he can always see us. I don't know about you, but that's good news. That, that he can always see it. And so if faith gives me the ability to what? To jump in obedience to him. To do what he has called me to do. To, to act the way he has called me to act. Even when it doesn't make sense to me. Because I trust him. And, and that's what the Hebrew writer, Sister Wagner, was trying to tell us. And uh, when the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 11 and 6, he says, without faith, it is what? Impossible. He said, it's impossible to please God. Now, please note what the Hebrew writer says. The Hebrew writer says that without faith, it is impossible. He didn't say it was hard to please. He said it was what? It was impossible to please God. He said, because those who believe, those who come to him, must believe that he, first of all, is who he said he is. And then secondly, look at the text, that he is the rewarder of those who digitally, what? Seek him. In other words, bona fide faith trusts the fact that God is telling the truth about who he say he is. And he says that he is God. And then secondly, he's the reward of those that diligently seek him, meaning that he will do what he said he will do. Now, Sister Banks, it's, it's interesting. I find it interesting to see folk uh, or hear folk talk about how much faith they have, and they have in God while, act, while watching their actions. Uh, they declare their faith. That's profession. But when you watch the way they live, when you watch the way they conduct, their lifestyle and their conduct or their conversation suggests that they do not trust him to do what he said he's going to do. And Sister Collins, the problem is not that he uh, can't or won't do what he said he would do. The problem is, is that we having a hard time to get him to do what we want him to do. And, and how many of you know that the only thing God is obligated to is himself and his word and his will and his will? Let's look at uh, our introduction, if you will. It, our introduction, James primarily concerned for the epistle aims at the faithful life free from disunity and inconsistency. Now, it's, it's his concern is that the believers are unified and they are consistent in what they say they believe. As a church, if we really trust God, I mean really trust God, then we were unified around what God has said and we will be consistent in carrying out the mandate of God. And that's what, that's what James is concerned about. Number two, for James, we'll come back. For, for James, genuine faith looks and acts a certain way and consists of persistent faith. A desire for wisdom, a desire for doing God's will and not just hearing it. Self-restraint, control, and the problem of self-deception. Let me say that again, because that's important. For James, genuine faith looks and acts a certain way and consists of persistent faith. Persistent faith. A desire for wisdom. A desire for doing God's will and not just hearing it. You know, when you really want to please God, you don't want to just hear what God is saying, but you want to what? Do. And that's what, that's what the scripture says, that he that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the church. Not just for the sole purpose of the church hearing it and saying amen, but so that the church would what? Do what he has said he would do. And then real faith leads to self-restraint, which is control. 
it, 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 real faith controls my action. It controls my, what, passions. It controls my thoughts. It controls how I live my life. Because if I am genuinely operating in faith and really have a desire to please God, then I, it ought to be reflected in my conversation. It ought to be reflected in my decision making. It ought to be reflected in my lifestyle. It ought to be reflected in every aspect of my life because it gives me some restraints. It gives me self-control because all of us at some time or another, we're always fighting the flesh. We want what we want. But you get to a point, Michael, at least you should get to a point to where what God wants is far more important than what you want. Somebody ought to say amen. And then not only does genuine faith do all those things, but the last thing it says, it keeps us from self-deception. And there are a whole lot of us that are operating in self-deception. We are deceiving our own selves. So many of us think that we are what we're not. Many of us think more highly of ourselves, Sister Williams, than we ought to. But genuine faith will, will, will keep you from grading your own paper. And it will allow you to trust God to be the grader. Because Pauline, every time I graded my paper when I was cheating in school, I always got an A. Not, 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 not Sister Wesley, there was no need in me cheating if I wasn't going to get an A. Now, 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 if I graded my own paper, now, Sister Wimmer, the teacher was in trouble when the teacher said, grade your own paper. As a matter of fact, Nelda, I liked when the teacher told me to grade my paper because every time I graded my paper, I got an A every time. It helped me somebody. But in this life, in this Christian life, genuine faith keeps you from self-deception. It keeps you from grading your own paper, and it trusts God to do it. And listen at this, when, Mabel Jones, when God grades your paper, when God becomes the standard, when you what, judge your life accordingly to the word of God, one thing is for sure, the word becomes a mirror, and you will always see your shortcomings. And he allows you to see your shortcomings, Sister Bradley, not so that he can destroy you or he's trying to embarrass you or he's punishing you, but he's allowing you to see your shortcomings, Nelda, so that you can make the adjustments in your life, so that you can line your life up to his. That's what genuine faith does. Number three, James warns of the effects of double-mindedness and deficiency in prayer as causes of sin. Did y'all see that? As you read the book of James, James is going to talk about being double-minded. James says, don't be double-minded. Double-minded, you're, you're, you're thinking one way and doing another, or you keep changing your mind. And really, that's an actor, as he's talking about, two-faced folk. You're double-minded. And what double-mindedness does, it leads to inconsistency in prayer. Because brothers and sisters, as the people of God, when we pray, we ought to be praying for God's kingdom to come to bear, not our own, and not the kingdom of anyone else, but the kingdom of who? Of God. Number four, James highlights the inversion, the inversion of values that a true relationship with God brings. He highlights the inversions of values what a, that a true relationship with God will bring. When you are Sister Quilla in a right relationship with God and you're growing in that relationship with God, then your values ought to be adjusted. As you grow, that's how you know you're maturing, is that your values are, what, adjusting, they're changing. That's a, that's a song that the old church used to say, the way I used to walk, I don't walk no more. The way I used to talk, I don't what? I don't talk no more. 
The places I used to go, I don't go anymore. It's not that I can't talk that way. It's not that I can't walk that way. And it's not that I can't go to those places. I just choose not to. My values have changed. And my values have changed because I'm growing in my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Number five, there is danger in wealth, but there is blessing in poverty. There is danger in wealth, but there is blessing in poverty. As you read the text, James talks about that. Now, let me explain that. James not saying that uh, rich people are going to hell. He's not saying that having possessions is a bad thing. That's not what James is saying. And James is not saying that all of the poor folk go into heaven. And he said, and all, he's not saying in order to uh, be in a good relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ or to have true religion, you have to be poor. That's not what, what James is saying. James is saying, however, that you cannot look to your wealth as if it is an indication that God has blessed you or favor you over everybody else. And he says that even though you may have this world's goods, you ought to live a life of humility, knowing that all that you have belong to God. Now we say that, but how many of us really believe all that we have belong to God? And Sister Curlin, let me tell you something. The only way you really know that you believe that everything that you have belongs to God is when it's time to give it away and you have no problems. Help me, somebody. Oh, no, 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 no. And then, and then when you are poor, don't think because you're poor you don't have anything to give. Because let me tell you something. My grandmother didn't make much at all. But you couldn't beat my grandmother giving. Because my grandmother believed the song that she sung when she said, you can't beat God's giving. No matter how hard you try, the more you give, the more he gives to you. Just what? Keep on giving. Because it's really true. You can't beat God's giving. So please do not leave here thinking that if I'm poor, I'm in a good relationship with the Lord, I'm going to heaven. And if I'm rich, I, I don't stand a chance. Not so. That's not what James is teaching. But James is teaching that the true religion, a bona fide faith says that I may have this world's goods, but I live loosely with it. And if God calls for it, I give it to him knowing, one, it all belongs to him in the first place. Because how many of you know that uh, everything that you have, if, if God wanted to, he can take it from you and leave you. Amen. Or he can leave you and take everything that you have, if that's what he chooses. So get the right perspective of what James is saying. Number six, for James, faith that is dispositioned toward God, faith is that position, I mean disposition toward God, which expressed in prayer, but is also necessary issuing where in action. It's real faith is the disposition towards God in prayer and in life. I'm praying to him because he, I have settled the issue that he's who he say he is. I'm praying to him because he's the only one that can really do anything about my situation. I'm praying to him and trusting him to lead me, to guide me, to answer my questions. And not only does it give me the right disposition toward God in prayer, but it gives me the right disposition toward God in my actions or in living. Are y'all with me? We're just dealing with the introduction as you read James. Number seven, for James, the believer must pursue wisdom from God, which will help the believer master life. The believer must pursue wisdom from God to help the believer master life rather than to be mastered by the challenges of living in a world that you can leave 
one confused, frustrated, doubtful, unused, and alienated from a life that pleases God. Y'all see that? James says, he that lacketh wisdom, let him do what? Ask God. And he says that God will give you that wisdom. Now, brothers and sisters, I know we think we're the smartest people in the world. And I know the more degrees we have, the more smarter we think we are. But not one of us will ever be smarter than God. How many of you already know what's going to take place on tomorrow? How many of you know what's going to take place in the next hour? How many of you know going to take place in the next second? None of us do, but God does. And, and what bona fide faith says that I trust God with my tomorrow. I trust God with my what? With my next hour. I trust God even with my next second. And because I trust God with it, then I'm going to communicate with God and ask God to lead me, to guide me. Because, Hazel, that's the only way I will master life rather than life mastering me. There's another song, and I told you I love the songs that the old church used to sing. Another song that the old church used to sing, so I sure wished I could sing because I would sing it. That song is many things about tomorrow. I don't seem to understand. But I know who holds tomorrow. And I know who holds my hands. And it goes on to say that he who holds tomorrow holds my hand. And so we can trust him because he already what? Knows. And you know what, brothers and sisters? When you don't operate in faith and when you're not praying consistently to God, asking God for his way, for his wisdom, for his counsel. If you're not operating in faith, you will always be operating in the flesh. And when you're operating in the flesh, you will have sleepless nights. You'll be, you, you be wringing your hands trying to figure out how you're going to make it. I'm trying to help somebody. Those of you who are online, somebody's peace may be disturbed right now because you don't know what the future holds. But I come to tell you, Sister Bradley, you may not know what the future holds, but you ought to know who holds the future. And Sister Wilma, I've come to the conclusion that no matter what happens, I'm going to trust him. And in the words of the late Charles Stanley, I'm going to trust him and leave the consequences to him. Because he and only he knows his will for my life. Oh, bless his name. Now, Andrew, when I'm operating in faith, when I'm obeying him, it may not please you. It might frustrate you. It might make you angry. It might cause you to isolate yourself from, from me. But I'd rather be isolated from you and be in good fellowship with him. I'd rather you be upset with me and he be all right with me. Are y'all listening to me? Faith says, I'm going to trust him and leave the consequences to him. Number eight, James is not concerned only with the faithfulness of individuals, but two of the community of believers. He's not just concerned, uh, Sister Williams, with you having faith or with you being faithful. He's concerned with the whole community being faithful. He wants, he wants the whole community to grow up in their trust, in their confidence in the Lord. Because we are a community, and that's exactly what we ought to be doing. I don't know about anybody else, but when I stand to teach, and every time I stand to minister the word, the purpose is not for you to see me. The purpose is for you to see him. 
The purpose is not for you to trust me. The purpose is for you to trust in him. Because brothers and sisters, I cannot do anything for you when you are in the midnight hour of your life. But he can. And when we are a community growing in our faith in him, then we will operate the way he tells us to operate. And let me tell you something. When this church, Greater St. Matthew, becomes the church or continues to operate in faith, there is no, there is nothing we cannot do. And there is no power that would be able to what? To stop us. Help me somebody. Number nine. For James, the royal, the royal law is rooted. The royal law is rooted in the second great commandment taught by Jesus. And there are some scriptures there. The royal law is rooted in the second great commandment taught by Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we must love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, mind, and body. But we must love our neighbor. As we what? As we love ourselves. So, so it, it's not good enough, Reverend Banks, for me to have it. It's not good enough for me to be okay or for me to be growing spiritually. I ought to love you enough to every time I come in contact with you, I ought to be encouraging you to what? To grow. I ought to be encouraging you to keep the faith. I ought to be encouraging you to, to, what? to pursue confidence in him. Because if you win, I win. If you lose, I lose. Because we are community of faith. Amen. You know, our ancestors understood that principle. Our ancestors understood that. You know, I can remember uh, Sister Wagner, and, and I like sharing that with my children every now and again, that uh, when I was growing up, right off of Martin Luther King on Balkan Street, when I was growing up, thank God, and I shout about this right now, that uh, I grew up, Miss Wimmer, in a community. Amen. Our street really was our community. I could remember uh, Miss B and uh, Miss Mary and the Andrews and the Wilsons across the street. And then we had Stephen, we had Miss Bozeman, and we had the Johnsons, and we had the Cross, we had the Campbells, and we had all those folk down there. And Sister Wagner, back then, I could remember when the community was functioning as a community, my mother would send us to Miss B and say, Mama say, can you send her a cup of sugar? No, that happened even in my day. And Miss B would send her children over and say, Miss Rena, um, Mama said, can you send a stick of butter? And let me tell you something. They were free to do that because nobody thought more highly of themselves than they ought to. Nobody thought that they were better than anybody else. And everybody understood every now and then, even the best of us ran short. And you, can, and you can go to the, to the community, you can go to your neighbors, and you can get what you need from them, and nobody put your business out down the street. Wonder what would happen, brothers and sisters, if the church become a community. If the church become a community of faith. If the church would become what God intend for it to become. If the church would operate by faith and the church would begin to be obedient and the church would love like God instructs the church to love, wonder how God would move in our midst. Help me somebody. When the community is functioning like the community ought to function, then the community will, 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 hit, will become a hindrance to Satan rather than Satan being a hindrance to the community. Number 10, that God is one is a reference to the Shema. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5, this September. Hear ye, O Israel, that the Lord your God is one, which deserves more than a confession of faith but actions produced by faith. Because God is who he is, he deserves more than a confession of faith. He, need, he deserves what? Actions. If I really trust him, I'll obey him. 
Now let me ask you, how many of you really do trust God? Now don't fool me. Don't fool me. How many of you really trust him? And those of you who are online, how many of you trust God? Now let me, now let me, let me give you an asset text. Because it's easy to say I trust God while everything is going well. Your, your, every bill is met. You doing fine. But what if God did you like he did Abraham? When he said to Abram, he says, Abraham, take your only son whom you love and sacrifice him unto me. Abraham, take Isaac up to the altar and put him to death. How many, yeah, somebody just said, mm -hmm. Oh yes, oh yeah, brothers and sisters, it's easy to say I trust him. But what if God calls or make a great demand on your life? Can you trust him then? Now, Greater St. Matthew, we are in one of those situations where it has been told us for a whole year that we are in uncharted waters, uncharted territories, and we are. The question on the floor is, can God be trusted? No, no. That yes, he can is his answer. And by the way, he can be. But can he be trusted? Can you trust him to operate in a way that he has called you to operate in? I'm not here to tell you who to vote for. That ain't my place. But my place is to tell you that you ought to trust him and you ought to operate the way he has said to operate. Because when God can be trusted, we will not use human persuasions. We will only do what he has what? Called us to do. Help me somebody. Now don't put me on Facebook for that one. And if you do, it's okay too. Oh, no, I'm being honest with you. It's easy to say I trust God when everything is going well. But when God makes great demands, when God really want to use you in a miraculous way, when God uh, calls you or puts you in an uncomfortable situation, the question on the floor is, can he be trusted? And should I, and maybe I ought to ask a different question. Can he trust you? Are y'all with me? Let's, let's go to the exposition. Because that was only the introduction. So let's go to the exposition. The name James is actually recorded in the Greek New Testament as Jacob. So when you read the book of James, the author is James. But in the Greek New Testament, it is seen as the name Jacob. But there's one in the, in the same. Because in that day, there were many Jameses. There were many Jameses. Although there are several men in the New Testament known as James, it is the half-brother of Jesus who is the author of this epistle. He is the half-brother of Jesus, and he was the pastor of the Jerusalem church. And as the pastor of the Jerusalem church, James, the half-brother of Jesus, is writing this epistle. Three. Acts 15, 23 through 29 records the only other correspondent coming from James in the New Testament. Acts 15, 23 through 29 records the only other corresponding coming from James in the New Testament. For in James 1 and 1, the author describes himself as the servant of God and Jesus Christ indicating that he regarded Jesus as deity. It means he regarded, I mean, he well, regarded Jesus as deity. Now, listen, the word servant in the Greek is the word dolos, 
which means bond servant or bond slave. Now, a bond servant was someone who willingly dedicated their entire life to their master. They willingly, they willingly dedicated their entire life to their master. Now, their confession was, I have a good master, and I refuse to be released from my servitude to him. And I choose to serve them for the rest of my life. I could go free, but I won't go free because I love my master, and I choose to what? Remain his servant. Now, James says, I am a bond servant of God and Jesus Christ. Don't miss that. He says, I am a servant in some translation, but it's really a bond servant of God and Jesus Christ. Now, what, jo what James was expressing was his dedication of service in a way that puts God the Father and Jesus Christ on, what, the same plane. He was saying that God the Father and Jesus Christ is what? Equal. Now, this is important, brothers and sisters. This is Bible study. So this is important uh, because being raised in the home, the same home as Jesus, James missed him initially as the Messiah. Remember, James was the half-brother of Jesus. They were raised in the same household, but James missed Jesus as the Messiah. He did not believe that his brother was the Messiah. But after the resurrection, somebody ought to say thank God for the resurrection. After the resurrection, Jesus appeared to James, according to 1 Corinthians. He appeared to James, and James believed. And here, James testifies that Jesus is equal to the Father. In other words, James is saying Jesus is God. And he is the son of God. He is part of the what? Godhead. And so James says, I am a bondservant of God the Father, but I'm also a bondservant of Jesus Christ. After the resurrection, after James met Jesus and James what trusted the atoning work of Jesus on the cross, James says he's no longer my half-brother. He's my savior, and he's my Lord. I wonder, this, I, wonder, I wonder, do you know who he is to you? Now, now listen, here, as we just said, James was acknowledging what? The deity of Christ. He was acknowledging the deity of Christ. Number five, James describes, James describes his addressees as the 12 tribes of the dispersion, of the dispersion, I'm sorry. The 12 tribes of the dispersion. Now the term dispor referred the fact that the Israelites after the destruction of the Northern Kingdom in 722 BC had been scattered. The northern kingdom had been scattered to places like uh, the Mediterranean, North America, Europe. They had been what? Scattered. When the northern kingdom came over and took over. Number seven. The number 12 here should be understood as symbolic. For the people of God, it's a symbol. It ought to be understood as symbolic of the people of God. The restored Israel, namely the church. And so therefore, this letter that James wrote was written to the 12 tribes, which meant James wrote primarily to the what? To the Jews. But then eventually, the letter was meant for the church that was made up of both Jews and Gentiles. And they had been scattered throughout the region 
because of persecution. Now, when you look at Acts chapter 8, when you look at Acts chapter 8, and I do ask that you would do that at your leisure, when you look at Acts chapter 8, you would discover that's when the, um, the f first uh, scattering took place, when they became under persecution. And when you look at a Acts chapter 8 and go on to ch Acts chapter 9, you're going to see that Saul was behind it all when the church was being persecuted, when believers were being put to, get, to death rather because of their faith in Jesus Christ. They were being scattered. So James is writing to those people who had been what? Scattered. N number eight says, it is the church consisting of both Jewish and Gentile Christians that James is addressing here. We just talked about that. Number nine, the, the composure of the 12 tribes was now no longer a matter of ethnicity or cultural, but of dedication of, to God and faith in Christ. Dedication to God and faith in Christ. And the dispor refers to all of the Christians Disperse throughout the world following Pentecost. And so, brothers and sisters, again, Acts is a good book to read. We're walking our men through the book of Acts on Monday night as we look at the ministry, the person, rather, and ministry of the Holy Spirit, and we look at the Holy Spirit giving birth to the church at Pentecost and how the Holy Spirit is using men to do miraculous things in the name of the Lord. But we also see how when you get to chapter uh, 5, how Ananias and Sapphira do a fake thing there. They have, they, they have fake religion. They try to pretend to be what they weren't, and they died as a result of it. And then as we keep on reading Acts chapter 5 on through Acts chapter 9, you see that the church comes under great persecution. Uh, the apostles ends up in jail, but even though they end up in jail, Hazel, the Lord comes along and he frees them. And when he frees them from jail, he tells them to go right back to the place where they were first arrested and do the same work that they was arrested for, and that is the preaching of the gospel. And so, so can I tell you, we might be in uncharted territories. It may be unfamiliar to us, but it ain't unfamiliar to the church. And it ain't unfamiliar to God. The church has always been under attack. Satan has always been, what, doing his job with trying to stop the program of God. The problem is not Satan. The problem is that the church ain't doing what the church ought to be doing. And Ephesians chapter 6 says that the church ought to be standing against worldliness, keeping worldliness out of the church. Somebody said the other day, we need a new gospel. What's wrong with the old gospel? Because the new gospel ain't going to save you, but the old gospel will. Now, now, you lead me to another song that the old church used to sing. I love to tell the story of unseen things in glory. It's an old story. But let me tell you something. Even in the 21st century, in 2024, it's still doing the job. It's still saving. Because Paul says that it is only through the preaching of the gospel can man be saved. You can tell folk if, if you want to, if they have enough faith, they can show up in the Ford and leave in a Cadillac. And every time they show up in the Ford, they're going to leave in the Ford. No, 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 no. That's, we don't need a new gospel. We just need to trust the old gospel and begin to live it out. Amen, somebody. Number 10. Verse 2 at once commands a change in perspective, which is a perspective of joy. Verse 2. Y'all see what it says? Verse 2 says what? It says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you are met with trials of various kinds. 
James says, change your perspective. He says, count it all joy when you come under persecution. Count it all joy when you're being lied on because of your faith. Count it all joy. Don't mumble, don't complain, don't look for a way out. He says, count it joy. And the reason James says, Sister Betty, count it joy when you come under persecution, he says, because you, then you will be aligned with the Lord. Because didn't Jesus suffer? Because of the kingdom's sake? He suffered because he what? He honored the Father. He loved the Father. And because he obeyed the Father. And Kathy, when you are walking by faith, bona fide faith, and living the way the Lord called you to live, and let me tell you something, you will come under persecution. But James says, count it all joy. And you ought to count it joy, Sister Ray, because you're in good company. If you read the scriptures, he said, because the apostles came under per great what persecution. And before the apostles came under great persecution, the savior of the world, Jesus Christ, came under great persecution. I hope I'm helping somebody. Number 11, the joy that James speaks of is not welcoming the test, but rather the results of the test. Now, I, I, I don't lie to nobody. I do not like tests. I don't like trials. I don't like being lied on. I don't like being misunderstood. I don't like being falsely accused. I don't like being ostracized and criticized. I do not rejoice over the test, but I do rejoice over the results. Because when you lie, when you misjudge me, when you persecute, it drives me to my knees. And every time I get to my knees, Brother Ray, I get more strength for the journey. So thank you for lying. Thank you for criticizing. Thank you for uh, what persecuting. Because what you meant for evil, help me somebody. God means for good. That's when you're walking by what? When you're walking by faith. Are y'all listening? 12, the results of wisdom, maturity, wisdom, and spiritual self-awareness. Spiritual self-awareness can only be received through trusting God in the midst of the process. Because let me tell you something. I said it earlier, but let me say it again, Sister Wesley. Sometimes God allows us to go through what we're going through so we can come to know who we are. Because some of us think we are what we are not. Some of us think we can do what we are incapable of doing. And sometimes God has to put us in various situations to show us that we are not what we think we are. That we cannot handle what we think we can handle. And we don't know what we think we know. And so we don't, Michael, thank God for the test, but you sure ought to thank him for the results that the test will bring about. And look at number 13. Real growth concerns nearness to God. Real growth concerns nearness to God. Inasmuch as suffering does not necessarily produce godly character. Does not produce godly character. But it does. It ought to, well, it ought to cause you to get near to God. 14, receiving trials with joy is a firm acknowledgement that the believer does not have control over what events occur in their lives. We don't have control over what comes. We don't have control, angel, of what test that's going to come in our lives. Some of us are, go through the test of sickness. We go through the test of financial woes. We go through the test of what relationship issues. We cannot control what tests come in our lives, but we can control how we go through the test or how we're going to come out of the test. 15, although an event itself cannot be controlled, one can determine one's own response 
to the event or circumstances. We can control how we gonna but behave. When folk lie, are you gonna are you gonna lie back? Are you gonna are you gonna trust God and stand still? Yeah, hold your peace and let the Lord do what? Fight your battle. How many of you know that when God fights your battle, it's a it's it's fault. Oh, yes, indeed. Somebody said it's worn. 16. A reaction is different from a response in that response involves reflection. A reaction is different from a response in that response involves reaction. I mean, reflection, rather. Instead of me reacting to situations or reacting to the trials that comes in my life, I ought to be responding to them. And I respond to them after I what reflect. And here's what, the, here's what it's saying. is that when I take the time to think about what the Lord done for me on yesterday, I come to the conclusion that if he did it then, he can do it again. It's called what? Reflection. And when I'm going through my trials and my tribulations and all of these other things, and I think about all of those folk that came before me, how they didn't have it easy, and how they, but they endured it. If God would bring them out, he'll bring me out. It was, it was around Christmas. We was in Louisiana at my wife's uh, uncle's house, and uh, my daughter uh, saw uh, a doll that was dressed, at, we call it Mammy Maid. You know how you dressed up like Mammy Maid? Uh, and uh, she, she questioned it and talked about it, talking about slavery. Daddy, we, we need to move away from that slave mentality and slavery. And I said, well, I don't, I don't have a slave mentality, sweetheart. I said, but uh, I like that history. I said, that's what I've been trying to teach you. I see, the problem with young folk, for the most part, is y'all don't understand the cost that was paid to get us here. That's why, that's why we don't value much anymore, because we have forgotten the cost. We don't want to think about slavery. We don't want to think about the, the history of our people, how they were tall and how they were beaten and how they were scarred in order for me to live where I live and in order for me to dress the way I dress, in order for me to drive what I drive. Our price has been paid. And when I take the time to reflect rather than react, I would always what experience joy. Because again, if he did it once, number 17, reflection for us who believe means interpreting the situation through the lenses of God's will and what? Wisdom. We, 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 we look at it from God's will and God's wisdom. Verse 18, I mean number 18. Verse three reveals a sacred cycle behind trials as ex experienced in the life of a believer. Look at verse number three. Verse three reveals a sacred cycle behind trials as experienced in the life of a believer. Number three says, for we know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And that word steadfastness means what? Endurance. Now, we look what it says. It says, for we know. Now, that's assurance. That's what Paul was saying in Romans 8, 28, when Paul said, for we know all things work together for the good of those who what? Who love God and who are the called accordingly to his prayer. All things work together for the good of those who love God 
and who are the called accordingly to his purpose. And so Paul says no matter what is being done, no matter what anybody is saying, no matter what traps are being set for you, you need to have the confidence of knowing that God will use all of that to work out his cause, to work out his will in your life. I hope I'm helping somebody, even you online, you need to know that God is in control of your situation and he's causing everything to work out for your good accordingly to his purpose and plan for your life. Number 19, throughout the epistle, James was used to term my brothers and sisters as a reminder of the, fam well, the familiar connection, the familiar connection that we have in Christ to each other as siblings and to God as Father. We are family. And listen at this. Let me take, give you some hard theology. Accordingly to the scripture, that if I'm saved and if you are saved, I am more your brother and you are more my sister than my biological brother and sisters if they are not saved. Because my relationship with Christ has to be exalted above my what, human relationship. Are y'all listening to me? And that's what James is saying. We are in a family. And we are in the family of God. And the only way we got in the family, we didn't walk down the aisles and gave the preacher our hand and say, I want to join the church. No, no, no. The only reason or the only way into the family is you must be born again. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom. And if I'm in the kingdom and you're in the kingdom, I am more your brother and you are more my sister and brother than my biological who's not. Are y'all listening to me? That's some hard theology, but that's the Bible. Look at 20. The trials or the tests to which James refers to are often thought of as pressures, as pressures experienced in life that challenge the believer's well-being or faith in God. Pressures in life that challenges the believer's well-being or faith in God. 21. A close look at the content of the epistle of James should cause us to think more carefully about the nature of those tests of these tests, rather, the nature of these tests. What's the nature? Why am I going through what I'm going through? What's the root of it all? 20 and last. Perhaps the tests are tests to determine the quality of our commitment to God and to godly living rather than just our wherewithal to endure hard times. What you're going through, you're going through it to determine the quality of your commitment. Because I start off by saying, it's easy to say I trust God. But how do you handle life's trials? How do you go through your time of testing when ain't nobody looking? How are you living? Are y'all walking with me? And so here's what James says as I close. When James is talking to his audience, as he would talk to you and I, James wants us to understand that the Christian life is a marathon. And he says that trials and tribulations are designed 
to help us endure or to be steadfast in the race. They're not designed to stop us or to prevent us from running. No, 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 no. James says they're designed to give you endurance. If you ever go into the gym, Sister Wagner shared with me once before every Wednesday, uh, before she come here for Bible study, she goes by the Y and she exercises. And, and let me tell you about Sister Wagner going by the Y to exercise. Because when I did go by the Y and exercise, I understood that there were times it got tedious. And when you are lifting weights or you're doing certain exercises, it causes uncomfortableness. It causes muscles to burn because you're trying to burn off fat and you're trying to increase your muscles. You're going through some, what, some strenuous things. But you don't quit. You keep, you keep going. And what happens over time is you develop endurance. You develop steadfastness. And, what Paul, and that's what James is saying. That trials, when they come, don't stop. Don't throw in the towel because you've been lied on, because you've been falsely accused, because you've been mistreated, because you've been ostracized, because folk who used to call you don't call you no more, because folk don't, ain't speaking to you. James says, don't quit. He said, keep going. He said, now don't you respond, in other words, don't you react, rather, in other words, don't quit speaking to them because they ain't speaking to you. Don't lie on them because they lying on you. Don't ostracize them because they ostracizing you. But James said instead of you uh, re uh, reacting, you ought to what? You ought to respond. And he's saying your response ought to come from your reflection. And here's the reflection. If they did it, Jesus says to the green tree, what you think they're going to do to you? Jesus said, if they did it to me, what do you think they're going to do to you? And, and let me tell you something else. Learn how to look beyond people and see the spirit of Satan at work. And the only way you can defeat the enemy is with love. I wish I had a church. Bonafide faith says, I'm going to take the leap, even though I don't see him, knowing that he sees me. Bless his holy name. Let's pray. God, we bless your name. We thank you for your word and your spirit. Thank you for the testimony of James who says to us, if we really believe, it will be shown in how we live. Help us to live our life for your approval and not for man. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. And thank God.